lightning like Steve McQueen. I'm in the fast lane when the light turns green. And I built tough, I ain't nothing but grit. Cause I made rugged blood, sweat, and spit. Yeah, like a horse I fly. Gonna push yourself in for a bumpy ride. I like to play hard, but I work harder. And I weather the storm cause I'm built stronger. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? We are back. We are live. It is the Freight Coach Morning Show, the top morning show in transportation coming to you guys every single weekday, 8.30 in Pacific, 10.30 Central to break down some industry headlines, and most importantly, provide some actual insight into what you can do with all of this information. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome. This is the real side of freight, ladies and gentlemen, and I say that before every single show, and what I mean by that is I only speak with transportation professionals because at the end of the day, I want to talk to the right individuals who have done what you're looking to do or who are currently doing what you're trying to achieve so you can take that information apply it, utilize it, and see a meaningful difference in your business and your life. All right, you guys, I got a very special guest that we are going to bring up right away. You guys, we're talking about all things LTL today, and we're just going to break some of this stuff down and the importance of having an LTL offering inside of your brokerage. So I got my man, Robert Cowton, in the house with SPI Logistics. Robert, what is going on? Oh, it's going well. How's it going, Chris? Oh man, it's going great. It's been we the last time we saw each other was in Nashville at Rendezvous in May, and you know we had it, a it was awesome finally meeting you in person. And B, you know I, I really enjoyed the conversations that we were having about it was you know it was everything. It wasn't just about work. You know it was about you know taking care of yourself physically and and all of this stuff as well. And you know it's I'm just really glad that you're able to join me today and talk about this stuff. So what's been new in your world, man? Well, same thing actually. Just the touch is. Uh... It was fantastic to meet you because, you know, we live in a world with a lot of virtual meetings and virtual things, but sitting down and actually talking to you, I learned a whole lot more about how your business structure works and, and obviously your personal goals on fitness and other things and how you perceive it. So when you, that human touch still matters, it truly, truly does. And, uh, uh, yeah, I've been, it's just been steady busy for me. Um, it's been uh, a lot of, you know, I've been juggling a lot of loads with constant mm -hmm. changes. And so the only thing that's constant is change and yeah. is, well, how well you manage it. No, I'm right there with you, man. So do what, like the thing I, I, I think that I love about a lot of things, you know, like people have their own little niches that they, they operate in. And especially like that, you know, that's kind of what I found out at uh, rendezvous was it's like all the agents, how they kind of all have their own little market carved out there. And, you know, I like LTL is something like we, we offer it inside of our agency now, but, and, and I did it because like we had a customer or we have a customer, excuse me, that has a, a big LTL footprint as well as a big full truckload. And like, I just saw all these opportunities start coming. I'm like, we got to get after this. Like, this is too much that's going away. So we started doing it and we're moving a couple of LTL shipments now and building up that familiarity with it. So like from your perspective, man, like why, why is it so important to, to offer that? Well, a few things I would say first and foremost, it's a value add. You know, we all started somewheres in the world of freight, especially if you're a freight agent or you have your own brokerage, but just we'll talk specific agents because both of us are is you started somewhere at ground zero. You had no customers. Neither of us did. And we started. And generally, we typically get into that truckload mode. That's kind of the first avenue we go. Maybe some partials, but it's either going to be van, reef, or flatbed is kind of the traditional route that most agents tend to go. But what happens is you, you hope you're just trying to get your foot in the door with one customer to get that first load, right? And then, you know, depending on how the customer works, you got to build that trust and a relationship. But as you hear, you've interviewed Mike Mikulik, you've met him, you spent some time with him and his big message is always, he says it at Rendezvous, he says it all his interviews, his email correspondences, articles he puts out, what's he say? Build deep relationships. Yeah. And how do you do that? You got to start small and you build that deep relationship. Now, when you get like, my theory is whenever a sales rep comes back to the office at their company, manufacturing a distributor or whatever, says, we just landed this big contract. We're going to need trucking. So there's a meeting and you want it so that when they're in the boardroom or in the back room having this meeting about this, someone puts up their hand. I'm calling Chris. I'm calling Rob for those projects. I know exactly who to call. We can trust that get that job done. That's what you want. You want your name to be that person. So where that comes in with LTL. So if you're always just doing flatbed freight and they do project work, well, sometimes they have to order a pallet of parts, a yeah. pallet of this, a pallet of that. When you can build that trust and they realize, oh, one phone call, I can call Chris, 
So we, we need to bring in all these parts. We need to do an assembly of this machine. And then we're going to put it on a flatbed and then ship it to the site. And we can do that all through Chris. Wow. Because now with the value out of the LTL, um, when I say LTL, there's two types. There's partials, which goes on a private carrier, non-tariff. So yeah. it could be one, one to four skids. And many people do that. But I would, when, we, when I refer to here on this show, LTL freight, I'm referring to the common carriers who have tariffs. Yeah. Partial would be along the lines of someone says, I got two skids. I want to pay it as a truckload or I want it two skids as a partial um, non-transfer. There's private carriers that do that service, but we're specifically talking about this. So now take, imagine this, you have your customer might be in say Texas and all of a sudden they got a pallet in Chicago, a pallet, no, two pallets in Ohio, um, a couple in Wisconsin or something. And then you could either ship them separately or you can turn around and say, you know what, where's the central point? I can bring all that freight to one central place, put them onto one truck and ship it to the customer. So you've got multiple options to work with that, but what it does, it helps you build you're you're building yourself within the network of your customer supply chain. That's yeah. really the goal. And that when you can provide uh, cross dock consolidation, utilizing truckload partials and LTL freight, intermodal rail, all combination to accommodate price strategies, time time uh, deliveries, all those, and you're an integral part. That's a winning long term relationship. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you, man. I think like I, I always like to put clarification out there for people when I say when you're building your book of business to focus on one thing and and really build out your experience. I, I'm really kind of gearing that towards the people who are kind of just starting out, or you know, maybe they they're switching into you know to a, a different mode or something. I think like having that same repetitive conversation time and time again is great for the reps that you need. But when you're in the door with somebody and they're coming to you with options on different modes like you have to explore those right like you can't just get to a point where you're like hey i only want your full truckload um that might work for a little bit but i i truly feel like it's only a matter of time before somebody who can do full truckload ltl and drage comes in and they can do it all at a high level and then it's only a matter of time before they'll work your way out of there because they want those providers who can do multiple things and then again it's like it's a great way to separate yourself out there because that's your way to prove that there's stuff out there that you're going to do that other people are not willing to and well to, to that point as an example just last week i have a customer i ship flatbed freight 95 percent of the time we've been doing a job going from canada into nevada and yeah. all of a sudden they had one pallet and they're like we need it rushed so i offer them the, no no we need it faster so what did i do because of SPI and the connections we have and in my knowledge, I air freighted it. So within the hour, I had a quote, freight was picked up within an hour and a half, overnighted, right? And I mean, we had a little stumble with the delivery, but overall, they met the customer's needs and I made arrangements and things happened. Like I did things over and above to make it work out for everyone. But the point was, I didn't just say, well, I can't do that. I didn't turn yeah. that freight away. My customer knew they can call me and they relied on me to come through and I did. And that was the key point. And so see some brokers, when they get into this industry, they say, I'm a reefer carrier that does this lane. That's what I'm focused on myself. And I think you're kind of in the same ballpark. We're more customer driven. I mm -hmm. focus on my customer. Yeah. I don't worry. And then I take their needs. And this way, when they have a, a expedite or they have, they say, Hey, this is a warranty return. We want the cheapest possible. I don't care if it takes two weeks to get there. I meet those needs. That's what my job is to meet the needs of whatever they have moving at that point in time. And I take those parameters and I present it to them and I, and I manage it from start to finish. No, 100%. Like I, I sell on my core competencies, you know, like I'm, I'm in a position to where it's like, I, I have extensive experience doing full truckload drive in full truckload reefer and, you know, open deck over dimensional. I, you know, cause it's like, I almost split my career in half over the 14, 15 years that I've been doing it, where the first half of my career is I only did drive in and reefer full truck load. And then the second half has only been open deck and heavy haul full truck load. So it, you know, it, it is very customer specific out there where it's like when I get in the door with somebody, if they come to me with an opportunity, unless I have zero clue about it at all, that's the only time I will say, hey, I think that there's a better person out there for them. I will even go as far as recommending them somebody that i know can can accommodate that at a higher level that i can because i feel like it's in the best interest of my customer at that point but for the most part yeah man i'm going in there and i'm going to uh, um, work every opportunity and then i'm going to talk to them if it is one of those situations where 
you know, I don't have a ton of knowledge on it. I'm going to ask them, hey, what does this opportunity look like? How many of these are coming? I will work on this and I will come to you with a solution. I'm not, not just going to let it go to the wayside on the long term because I, I feel like in, in, in some of these instances, man, it's only a matter of time. I, at least this is what I tell myself. Maybe I'm psychotic. It's only a matter of time before somebody who's better than me is going to get in the door and they're going to fucking eat my lunch. Well, and something else to be aware of is that getting into the LTL freight game sounds great. You pick up a pallet or two and you ship it from point A to point B. Sounds real simple, but unfortunately, it's not that simple. And the thing to think about is that it, depending on what broker or an agency you're with and their connections to the LTL world, you got to do a lot of training and we'll get into that in a moment. But something I wanted to address where you can, again, if you're if you're shipping truckloads with your customer and you're building that deep relationship and you're finding out that, oh, they're already shipping with some common carriers directly. OK, so that's a harder one to break through, because remember, LTL freight may not represent the higher profit that you're expecting. Like you're not going to make as much, you know, you can't just put 10 percent on a hundred dollar order. So yeah. you're going to have some minimums there. But again, when you're not, when you're booking a truck for 2000, you're putting a profit on it. You're not making the same kind of dollars per transaction. So it, it becomes a volume thing, but where, where it comes in is that sometimes when you, if your customer is working direct with carrier, with the common carriers, what I'd bring up to them is saying, let me analyze your business a little bit, because I can guarantee right now, many of the major there's, there's regional LTL carriers, and then there's the nationals. And they also, we'll get into some of the details here shortly, but the thing I just want to address is that many of these carriers, remember what an LTL freight common carrier who has a tariff is job is their job is to pick up and deliver LTL freight to consolidate and as efficient as they can to service within their network. They can get freight from Florida to Seattle or Florida to uh, Vancouver in, in a pretty efficient way. And so they have to maximize capacity in their trucks. They have to maximize, be as efficient as they can to keep their costs down to offer us the pricing. And what's happening now to do that, a lot of the carriers are starting to get their pricing teams and their data entry teams offshoring and nearshoring um, uh, employment services, so agencies. So when that happens, there may it's cheaper for them because it's kind of like a valve. If their business picks up, they can say, well, we need two or three more data entry people. And then when it quietens down, they can turn it off and say, well, we, well, we only need here. So they're saving money. But with that, the staff aren't trained near as much compared to how it used to be. So therefore, I'm noticing in the last few months, uh, like I have actually a, an auditor, a freight auditor that I pay 20 hours a week to help me with my LTL business. Yeah. And uh, we spend a ton of time on, on price corrections all the time. So where you can get your foot in the door is if you're knowledgeable about the LTL and you, you gain that knowledge, you can say to the customer, I'm pretty sure you're getting overcharged on a, yeah. I will, I will find you money. And that's where all of a sudden they realize, Oh, I one, they can call you simplify their procedures Two, you, you learn their business and learn their products. And three, you're going to save them money and be consistent on it. Well, what, how can they lose out? Yeah, no, I, I feel you, man. And what, so like, you know, I wanted to touch on Canadian and, uh, us LTL. Like what, what's the, like, what, what's the big difference out there between the Canadian LTL, uh, shipments that are, that are moving out there. And I mean, if you want to talk cross border or intra Canada, however you want to run with that, man, go for it. So, yeah. So the two big thing is the pricing structures. So the Canadian structure is really simple. The United States, uh, United States system, super complex <laughs> and it can burn you if you don't know what you're doing. So the terms I'll use in Canada. So intra-Canadian freight is so simple. When you have a pallet, I'll keep it simple that it's easiest for everyone to visualize a four by four by four. So 48 inch length, 48 inch width and a 48 inch height pallet mm -hmm. is let's say it weighed 500 pounds. Okay. So if it weighs 500 pounds, well, a 48 by 48 by 48, you take that, you divide it by the magic number 1728 will tell you that's a 64 cube. You times that by 10, that gives you 640 cubic pounds. So essentially in Canada, what they're going to bill you on is the greater of cubic weight or actual weight. So if your customer says, Chris, I need you to ship one pallet, 48 by 48 by 48, 500 pounds, you're going to be billed at 640 pounds. So if the customer calls you back an hour before the truck is coming, hey, we have to add five more boxes. Is it the same? Is it still 48 by 48 by 48? Yep. What's the weight? 595 pounds. Oh, don't worry about it. It's the same price. So simple. The minute 
it goes over six. If all of a sudden they said, well, we added five boxes. Now it's 48 by 48 by 54 and it weighs 600 and 750 pounds. Then you have, then they're going to get billed. That's a 750 pounds. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the simplicity there. And then what happens in the Canadian side that makes it simple is it's structured. They have a minimum charge in a lane. So say Toronto to Vancouver, there's a minimum charge. It, then it goes from minimum to 500 pounds, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. Some of them will have some slight breakdowns, but let's just say 500, 200, 2,000, 5,000, and then it jumps up to uh, 10,000, and then it goes up the truckload. So if you have a pallet that's that 750 pounds, so say it's four by three by four, so the actual weight is heavier than the cube. So say it's 700, 555 pounds, you're going to get billed at the 500 pound rate. At the 750 pound rate though, the computer systems that the LTL carriers have are going to calculate the 500 rate times it by the 750. And it's also going to look at the thousand pound rate by and say, hey, it's cheaper to build them at the thousand pound rate. So you'll see on the invoices deficit. So they'll take the 750 and they'll put 250 and make it a thousand pounds and give you that benefit of the doubt. So that's how they, so it's really simple. So you're always getting the cheaper of, if gotcha. that makes sense. Yeah, okay. no, no, that, that, yeah, sorry. That so, so that that's, it's really simple. Now, the only caveat is this, if a customer says this is top load, okay, but you have to look, you have to always know the freight. You have to study and, and go ideally visit your customers to see the freight. Because if they say, well, I, yeah, this, is this, because you're going to get carriers asking you, is this stackable freight? What that means, can they literally, you know, say you had a pallet with bolts and nuts and it's boxes. Yeah. Can they take someone else's freight and stick it on top? Is your customer okay with that? You have to educate that. If they say, if, if they have something where they're shipping some kind of cabinet and they just built it and they it's all nice and wrapped, they don't want scratched or anything and it's only four feet tall, but it's pretty heavy, 750 pounds, you're not going to put that on top of another skid. So you're going to have to tell the customer, they say, well, we don't want this stacked and we don't, you know, we don't want nothing on top. It's kind of funky. Okay, so you know what you have to do now? You have to bill it at, say it's a five foot long by four foot, but it's only four feet tall and they want non-stack. You have to build it at 96 inches, the height of the trailer. So you're buying that space. So remember, I'm, before I mentioned that LTL's carrier's jobs are to pick up throughout whatever given city, yep. consolidate the freight, get every inch of that trailer. Like there's horror stores of literally terminal managers cutting something down to fit that other pallet in there kind of idea, right? But they want trailer stuff to maximize every inch. So they, if you, if you say non-stack and they can't put nothing there, now, then they have to buy the space. Some carriers will put what they call load tables where they put logistics bars and stack the skids on top. Um, but you have to study every carrier. There's a lot of studying involved, but that's the simplest thing about the Canadian. Cubic weight or actual weight, that's all you have to understand. And then unless you want to buy the space above it, then you're, then you're taking up that whole height above it. Now, we get into the United States. A lot more complicated. So yeah. if you're shipping from Canada to the US or US to Canada, we have to follow the United States protocols for pricing. So the pricing is based off of the NMFC, National Motor Freight Classification, which is a, basically, it's a standardized uh, definition of, of products. Yeah. Um, and it takes that product, groups them, there's hundreds of groups, but then that group based on the definition of the product, uh, there could be, uh, then it goes by density or lengths, or there's a variety of things we can touch, we'll touch in a minute, but, but basically you got your your, whatever the description, let's say it's um, plastic golf balls or something or or metal sheets, right? Metal yeah. plates, me metal plates or nuts and bolts, hardware. So you have to find the right grouping and then you take that, you know, it might say densities. Okay, so what's the density of this shipment? And then it will tell you, okay, that's a freight class 75 or freight class 55. So you got to know the NMFC and the freight class, which is derived based off of density as well as Handling, stowability, and liability. So they take all that. So obviously, and then there's 18 freight classes within the within that 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 turns it into. So from kind of class 50 to class 500. And what what's more favorable for carriers is to class the lower classes, like anything under 150 and less, because that means it's more dense. Right? Yeah. You know, class 50, 55, 60 are all density. That's what they like because it's heavy, low, and then they. So if you have a box of ping pong balls or toilet paper or paper towels, those are bulky and lightweight. So that's, so those are unfavorable unless they can be stacked on top of those pallets of bolts. So you're, you're consuming a lot of space. So that's kind of the, the gist of it. So it's very complex to understand because you have to like, you'll phone a shipper and say, uh, what freight class do you normally ship at? Uh, 55. What's the NMFC? I don't know. 
and they'll say, well, so here's what can happen. Think of going to an LTL carrier, kind of like going to Expedia. There's that rack rate Yep, is kind of the, the way. So you call, if you just called up Best Western in any city, what's your rate? They're going to say, well, it's $250 a night. Oh, I'm um, some member. I have a membership. Oh, well, you get a discount. Now you get this price. Yeah. Right? Oh, or hey, I have a corporation. We're going to be having five sales reps. Oh, well, hang on. We're going to get you to our corporate salesperson. They're going to give you a rack rate minus their 75% discount. That's what LTL carries. So if, if you get a shipper that says, yeah, well, we ship with FedEx all the time at class 70. So what that FedEx agent did is they came in, looked at the freight and says, we're going to sign this account in FAK 70. But that only applies if the carrier has done that. If you go pick up separately, that may not apply. So you have to be very careful because I'm just dealing with a customer. They say, oh, we always ship class 55. And I found that I found the product and they're right only if it meets a certain density. The other thing you have to know about is value of the goods, uh, length. Some of the some of the group, the NMFCs are based on length. Like if it's under 96 inches, it's this freight class. If it's over 96, it's this. If the thickness of the steel, if you're shipping, say, steel plates, if it's made of steel with um, this thickness, it ships at this freight class. Or you're shipping um, fiberglass rolls, like that you know to make boats and golf clubs and things of that nature. There's about ten different versions there because if it's weaving or or there's different styles of fiberglass, so you have to know those. And if they're in rolls or and what the lengths of the rolls are, so there's it's complex. Once you figure out for shippers, you have a standard. It makes it pretty easy, um, but it just the initial can be daunting. Um, how to do it. So that's, that's kind of the right, right there. That's the first big difference is, is the, the pricing structure. I, I think if anybody wants a literal masterclass on LTL of any regards, you just got to rewind this once this <laughs> recording comes out, because Robert literally laid everything out there. And you also indirectly laid out how people can prospect uh, more effectively inside of LTL by asking all of those questions on the front end, right? What what class? What's your uh, and the codes? Every, all of that stuff, right? Because you know, again, it's like you're you're so consumed in the moment when you're prospecting, right? Because like I, I just put out a, a post yesterday afternoon that you know it took us 18 months to get our first shipment move through a customer referral, right? So it takes a very long time to build relationships, and you know I have buddies of mine who are shippers who text me that watch this show all the time and they always back those things up like yeah it, it does take a long time to get all these things so it's like instead of backing yourself into a corner and saying yeah we can do that and then you don't ask the right questions to your customer or your prospects in those moments lt you know and then you bid it right say you bid it and then the ltl carrier goes and picks it up and they're like oh we got to reclass this uh this isn't anything what you said it was going to be on the initial quote Guess what? You're not going to be able to bill your customer for that, and then that that pallet might be double the price now, and now you're losing four hundred dollars. Hypothetical example on that move now because you didn't ask these questions on the front end and get all of this stuff lined up. And I know like LTL has since evolved where it doesn't really let you get rates without entering certain information now. But what if you know? Like I want to add, like honestly, what if that this is going to make you sound like a subject matter expert uh, out there? When you're prospecting all of these customers, I mean, uh, Cody says says uh, Robert needs to write on uh, write a book on LTL. This is gold. Um, well, the what if is that? Well, like you said, you can't do a quote. You can try to do a quote without it, but remember, again, when if you like, I prefer to do the quotes myself through the online systems because that's yeah. more accurate. If you phone a, an agent, a customer service agent, they're just going to ask you some generic questions and they're not going to take all the factors in, into consideration sometimes. And they're just pricing people that you can't hold. Well, you know what? Joanne told me this is the price. Well, it's based on the numbers. It's Remember, computers are ones and zeros. They just take numbers and they spit out numbers. Yeah. And, and just like, for example, I just had a shipment this past week where I booked it through one of those sites where you can you know, uh, book multiple carriers that choose multiple carriers at once. So I had a carrier that picked up in Wisconsin. They transfer it to a, the Canadian carrier. That Canadian carrier brought it to Vancouver who passed it to another carrier who passed it to another carrier. So four carriers were involved. And then there was an, they, they, they were trying to classify this business as a limited access. So I did the proper channels and I got it removed, but there's steps I had to do. And I know we're running out of time, but something else I wanted to really touch on before we, we get off is so that they're aware is the difference between Canada and the United States. 
uh, big one because I know it's we're in the heat of the summer right now, but yeah. in six in six months we're going to be into the freezing temperatures. The difference between Canada and U.S. with heated service and see in Canada carriers will in their tariff will um, will list uh, heated service and they'll say their standard for heated service in Canada will be they'll do all efforts to maintain at least at at zero or slightly above. United States, on the other hand, it is truly a carrier by carrier situation. If you say, if you call up to a, a customer, a LTL care and say, I need a quote, can you offer me heated service? You know what they do? They're not going to tell you. They're just going to say, okay, protect from free service. There's yeah. a difference. And literally some carriers in the United States, when they say you put on their heated service, when they see that, they're not going to call you saying, well, actually, we don't actually put heat. You know what they do? They take a blanket and throw it over top of your pallet. Correct. And then you also have to be very careful when you're booking. Like I encourage my customers. I look at the transit times. I have to, I look back at the weather trends, what's happening. And sometimes you have to really look at the carriers because if there's a freeze embargo, like um, if there, you have to look at their websites and read their tariff and their policies around their programs, because some of them will say, if, it's if we pick it up and the temperatures are within this range, because if the product arrives frozen, but you picked up in a zone that was in an embargo um, and then it gets delivered, well, you're kind of out of luck. So you have to, it's a buyer beware when you get into this uh, heated service business is all I can tell you is that you really have to work with your customers and educate them. And sometimes I, I'll be honest, I really just don't do heated service in the wintertime with LTL carriers. I just don't. Um, there's a couple I will. Um, there's a couple I will. And, and you know, because especially if you're shipping all the way from, say, Ohio to Alberta, you know, sometimes you need it. But sometimes, you know what your better choice is? If you have to, I'll pick it up and I'll bring it to, because in Ohio, the temperatures might be warmer and in Ontario it might be warmer. So you know what I'll do? I'll bring it to Toronto. And then I'll put it on a heated carrier from K Toronto to Alberta with a proper heated trailer. So those are the things you have to do to protect your customer and protect your own business, you know? And then the other thing to be aware of is if you're going to get into the LTL and you do dangerous goods, you need your training. You need to be dangerous goods certified in Canada for TDG, transportation of dangerous goods. And in the United States, you need your CFR 49. You need to understand every carrier is different, unique. You have to, you're studying a lot. When you're taking on the LTO world and you're getting at the dangerous goods, this is red carpet service and you need to understand each carrier's requirements because I've had drivers show up and say, I'm not taking it. This doesn't meet my standards. So you have to study this and understand and your job is to educate your clients uh, and customers about this. And there's a lot more to this, but you know the, the pricing differences, the heat differences, uh, the dangerous goods differences. Uh, we can get in, there's obviously the customs and then uh, you got to read the tariffs for each carrier in Canada and the United States and understand their tariffs and how it applies to your, if you have any accessory charges and services you're offering your customers. Yeah, I, Erica Hamilton said it best uh, that we need to bring you back uh, on, man, because I feel like we're, I, it's very rarely do, do I not lead conversations and <laughs> you are, but it is, it, there's so much value in what you just laid out there. I, I, there was no point in me to even need, needing to interject in any of this stuff, Robert. And, you know, like th this is like, you know, again, back to being niche focused and understanding the the freight that you're moving. Like this is here. If, if you're listening to what Robert's saying out here, you guys, this is why you just can't cold call for the sake of cold calling. This is why you can't just get into some of these situations and then figure them out as you go, because mistakes cost money in the real world. And you really need to be very, careful i'm not gonna say don't take risks or anything like that but you know just ask questions like i say all the time ask questions ask as many questions as you possibly need in these scenarios because it it, it will be your fault if it isn't done properly exactly and you know what with ltl freight just know regardless if it's canada or us they're busy they have thousands of shipments coming in on a daily basis you if you want to provide the value add service and add that component with your customer relationships is great but just know you're becoming a full-time babysitter when you're doing LTL freight. Because if a shipper, say the driver ran out of room in his truck, they're not going to call you saying, sorry, we couldn't pick up. You're not going to know unless you babysat that. You Next morning, you're going to, how come this wasn't picked up? Oh, well, we ran out of room. Has it been rescheduled? Oh, actually, it wasn't. Okay, we'll do it now. So you, there's a lot There's a yeah. lot to this game. Like It's way more intensive than any full truckload business can ever be except for heavy haul. So Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's definitely a high touch. Yeah.
uh, environment. That's for sure. But yeah, when we, we are, we are out of time already. And Robert, we're going to get you on the docket to come back on here again soon, man. Cause this is uh, truly fascinating to hear all of this stuff out there in the LTL world. But how does anybody reach out to you, man? If they want to find out more, I know I have a sick secret shipper audience that watches this show and they might just want to work with you for their LTL, man. So how do they find uh, you? Well, you can, uh, the easiest would be as you can go. I do have a, I don't have the channel that you do, but I do have a YouTube channel. I've put a little bit of content yeah. is a uh, CDN freight broker. Uh, sorry, at CDN Freight Broker 3708, or just type in CDN Freight Broker and you'll find me on YouTube. And then you can put a comment and I check my comments and I respond uh, to them all. So Perfect. that's probably the easiest or else just dial the SPI head office and um, ask for me, ask for myself, extension, love 653, it. extension 653. I love it, man. And if for some reason you guys cannot find Robert, just hit me up. I will gladly put you guys in contact with him. And as always, you guys, I know you guys got value out of this one, but if for some reason, if you you did and you're not subscribed, do your boy a solid. Subscribe to the show. Share it out there to your network because if you see value, your network's going to see value as well. We'll be back tomorrow, you guys. we got another guest coming on tomorrow as well. And we're going to continue to break things down as we do every single weekday, 8.30 in Pacific, 10.30 Central. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. And we'll be talking to you soon.